Hi, I'm David Mandy, president of O&M Partners. I want to welcome everyone today to the Sailfish Royalty Town Hall call. Sailfish trades on the TSX venture under the symbol FISH. They also have an OTCQX listing, SROYF. Um, we want this broadcast to answer your questions. Questions can be easily answered by going to the question portal of GoToWebinar, or you can email us. Any questions that remain unanswered will follow up in a timely manner after the call. For those who dialed in with your phone, the only way you can hear our pre-recorded introductory presentation is on your computer speakers. If that's not possible, you'll be able to hear the main presentation after seven minutes. So please stay tuned. Um, before we turn to our host and the main presentation, I'd um, like to introduce our special guest of introductory remarks from Akiba Lesman. Um, Leesman, excuse me. Akiba is the Chief Executive Officer of Mako Mining, and he's also the Executive Chairman of Sh Sailfish Royalty. Um, previously, Akiba was the Executive Chairman and the Interim CEO of Marlin Gold Mining, which led the and he led the company through the spin out of Sailfish and also the acquisition of Marlin uh, by Golden Rain Resources to form Mako Mining Corp. He also serves as the Chief Executive Officer and Director of MAKO, um, a director also of Bonterra Resources. He's also a consultant at Wexford Capital. A real pleasure to turn the call over to Kiba. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Akiba Leesman. I'm the CEO of MAKO Mining. Now, this is a very exciting moment for both MAKO and Sailfish. Uh, on May 12th, we started to put the high grade through uh, our operating plant, which was initially scoped out to be a 500 ton per day operation in northern Nicaragua. This is about 16 and a half gram material that's going through the mills right now. Uh, we are operating at a level uh, that we deem to be uh, commercial production. We're going to need to have some level of sustainability uh, to, uh, to make sure that our accounting is declared a commercial production, which we're targeting for July 1st. But this is the first moment in MAKO's history that we're processing what is the highest grade open pit mine in the world, bar none. Now, as this relates to Sailfish, a presentation that you're gonna be hearing about later today, is that Sailfish right now retains 3% of the effective gold that's gonna be coming from the San Albino uh, deposit. So right now we've started to sell gold. Uh, Sailfish has started to collect uh, its revenue from that. Uh, and in the very near future, we're going to be ramping up production uh, to 500 tons per day with the expectation uh, that we're going to be doubling production at 1,000 tons a day by the very end of next year. Now, how are we going to do this? The overall resource at San Albino is relatively small. It's about 270,000 ounces uh, in all categories. That being said, the resource just over at San Albino was only delineated on about 230 meters of strike length. On our property concessions, 188 square kilometers, of which Sailfish has a royalty on the vast majority of those claims, we have already extended any uh, strike extension of the San Albino vein for an additional seven kilometers to the northeast of our deposit. So there's a few areas of growth that we have in the back of us over at uh, Mako. First, is to develop what we believe to be a deposit directly to the south, an area called Las Conchitas. We have an internal three-dimensional model on that. Uh, by the first half of next year, we're going to be putting out our maiden resource at the Las Conchitas area, of which Sailfish has a 2% royalty on, with the ability to begin mining it at the very end of 2022, such that the full year of 2023, we'll be mining at 1,000 tons a day between San Albino and Las Conchitas, of which Sailfish will retain uh, its uh, its share of those uh, proceeds. In the longer term, we do believe that we have the potential to find a multitude of San Albinos on our 188 square kilometer land package. So the first time in Mako's history, we're going to be putting drill holes outside of the direct San Albino and Las Conchitas areas, really for the first time. This has been a deposit, an area, uh, a mining camp that has been known about for hundreds of years, but there has not been a single bit of modern exploration with the drill bit to occur outside of direct areas over at San Albino and Las Conchitas. 
And again, Sailfish does have a royalty on the vast majority of those 188 square kilometer uh, uh, the ground and concessions that Mako currently owns. So this is an extremely pivotal, uh, pivotal moment for uh, both Mako and Sailfish. This is the first time that Mako is able to uh, process gold in a level that we would deem to be commercial. This is the first time that Sailfish is receiving royalty proceeds uh, from the operation. And now we have the ability to have our uh, both the operating company Mako and the royalty company Sailfish uh, grow over time. Sailfish is going to be at this interesting transition point where it's going to be receiving its first cash flows coming from Mako. It's going to be in the process of spinning off its exploration asset. So Swordfish, the spinoff company over at Sailfish, can go and invest in the projects that it owns. And then what Sailfish will be, will be a royalty company that has a portfolio of very robust royalties with the ability to, to have cash coming in the door that will then get dividended out to shareholders. So this is an extremely important moment for both Mako and Sailfish. We have the ability to generate revenues in a commercial capacity coming from San Albino. Sailfish has its other royalties that will be growing over time. Sailfish has excess cash right now. And with the proceeds coming in, it will initiate a dividend program as well. And on top of that, Sailfish spinning off its exploration asset over its swordfish will make this a much simpler company uh, for investors to, to understand. Mako, since May 12th, has been putting the high grade through its mill. And by high grade, there's uh, so far since May 12th, uh, we've been processing 16 and a half gram gold. Um, our high grade stockpile, which is well in excess of 8,000 ounces of gold, uh, contains uh, over a, a half ounce material. We're going to be processing exclusively, exclusively the high grade uh, between now uh, and the end of the quarter at the end of June, after which we're going to be blending some of the high grade uh, and the, the, the low grade. And 500 tons per day at those types of grades is actually going to be quite a bit of cash flow coming not only to Mako, but also through the 3% effective royalty interest. Uh, that Sailfish has uh, on this property. On top of that, we have a 9.56 gram per ton measure and indicated uh, resource over at San Albino. At 500 tons per day, when we get up to that level, assuming we are going to be producing somewhere in the neighborhood of nine and a half grams, that equates to a high 40,000 ounce run rate based on our expectations for metallurgical recoveries. Uh, so without providing direct guidance in terms of what the cash flows uh, will be coming in into Sailfish or, or for, for Mako for that matter, um, just putting simple math on these numbers at today's gold prices does mean that there is going to be a significant amount of cash coming not only to Mako, but also a significant amount of cash coming into the royalty uh, arm over at Sailfish. Really, the vast majority of that cash flow coming into the company will then be uh, dividended out to shareholders as part of our, our long-term dividend strategy over at Sailfish. So for, for all the investors out there, I, I encourage everybody to, to follow what both Mako and Sailfish uh, are doing. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, I, I sit, on, I on, both sit on, on both sides of the spectrum, of the being, spectrum CEO being CEO of Mako and, uh, and uh, executive chairman, uh, executive over, chairman over Sailfish. Again, I just want to reiterate, this particular month in, in May of 2021 happens to be the most pivotal month uh, within Sailfish and Mako's uh, history, where this is really the first time that we're able to have a commercial operation with substantial amount of cash flow coming into Sailfish, where we're going to be able to, to manage both the Mako and Sailfish businesses in a way that has never been managed before. Thank you, Akiba Leesman. Uh, again, Akiba is the Chief Executive Officer of Mako Mining and the executive chairman of Sailfish Royalty. Now we're gonna to turn to the company presentation. Our host, Cesar Gonzalez. Cesar is the director and the chief executive officer. Uh, he was the co-founder um, of Sailfish Royalty. Uh, previously, previously uh, Cesar served as vice president of corporate development and also director of Marlin Gold Mining uh, through the construction and the commissioning of La Trinidad Gold Mine. Uh, the spin out of Sailfish Royalty, and then ultimately the acquisition of Marlin by Golden Rain Resources to form Mako Mining. Um, Caesar also serves as the VP Corporate Development of Mako. He's chairman of the board of directors of Bonterra Resources and as well a consultant of Wexford Capital. On that note, I'm going to turn the call over to Caesar. Thank you, David. Let me get my webcam up.
and the presentation on the screen. So I have the presentation and I believe the webcam is loading up. There we, there we go. Awesome, it works. So thank you to Akiba for that introduction and I'm glad he was the guy that introduced this call because he knows more about the operations at Maker than just about anyone else other than our COO, Jesse Munoz. And it's important that he highlighted what is happening at Mako. I have to you know, focus my attention on what's going on here at Sailfish for uh, this presentation. But whatever is happening at Mako is also affecting Sailfish because the San Albino stream is one of our cornerstone assets and it's starting to pay. A very exciting time. We received our first delivery, as Akiba said, on the 12th, actually the 11th. We press released it on the 12th and the gold keeps coming. This morning, I got some more photos of some security cameras that we have in our refinery. We had another shipment that, ju that just left site. I think Akiba posted it on Twitter. So most of you guys have already seen those same pictures that I have, but a very exciting time. And wanted to clarify a couple things. I have on the screen slide 13 from our presentation, which talks about the uh, restructured stream on San Albino. And there are two concessions that are the historical concessions at San Albino. That is San Albino Mura and then Hikaro. And we have either a 3% stream, which you can see this little uh, square here around the San Albino deposit. That's where the stream is. And then we have a 2% on everything else. Um, since these, um, or since the stream was restructured, Mako has acquired an additional concession and been granted another concession called La Segoviana. Uh, we do not have royalties over those properties. So when Akiba talks about 188 square kilometers, he's talking about the total. He was very clear that we have uh, royalty exposure on the majority of the concessions, but I just wanted to clarify that a little further. You know, these two blocks are where we have exposure. And as he mentioned, San Albino is being mined now. We're receiving deliveries at the rate that he, uh, that Akiba mentioned, uh, being a steady state. Um, you know, we should be producing north of 40,000 ounces a year just from this block here at some of the highest margins in the industry because the grade is so high for an open pit. And what that means for sailfish is at today's gold price is uh, well over $2 million a year in cash flow. Uh, and if anyone has been a shareholder for the past couple of years, they know that when we get cash flow into this business, we buy back shares. That's what we have been doing. And going forward, we will continue to do so, but also look into paying a dividend, um, more, more than likely, likely in the form of a special dividend. But we like to return cash to shareholders in one form or another because we ourselves are shareholders. Akiba and I created this company. It was a brainchild while we were at Marlin, uh, you know, working on this mine in Mexico. We saw an opportunity to do a stream. We did it. We created this company and it took it public. So we created it in 14, 2014, we took it public in 2018, and we have been compensated with equity, uh, mostly options. And because of that, we think like you guys, um, nobody on this call has, has taken a salary from this company. Um, we're all shareholders. So we're aligned in the way we think. And um, you know, the last time I checked, shareholders like to get dividends, they like to get uh, share repurchases. And there has been some some there have been questions about our strategy in that are we missing opportunities could we have used that cash flow to do an acquisition or two we've acquired a lot and i will go back to a, a slide here that i have in the presentation that shows some of the history of the company here we go so started in 2014 as a private subsidiary of marlin we spun it out we're very familiar with spin outs we think they add a tremendous amount of value in this sector, and we are excited to be working on a spin out as we speak. Um, that's Gavilanis, our silver property, which we plan to spin out, combine with another asset, and form a company which Akiba mentioned would be called Swordfish Silver Corp. So we're very familiar with spinning out. You know, Sailfish was a spin out, Swordfish is going to be a spin out. You know, our, our mama fish is having a bunch of baby fish. But if you look here, there are a number of bullets. Some of them are about normal course issuer bids, others are about uh, acquisitions, restructurings, 
uh, we, we are busy and we have been busy and every deal that we've done has been viewed through the eyes of a shareholder. You know, management um, makes up one of the largest uh, shareholder groups and our controlling shareholder Wexford Capital, which is in the business of investing money. And, you know, together we've formulated a growth path that you see today. We have a portfolio of six royalties, one stream and a silver property. Our market cap is about 80 million US. We have about uh, just over 4 million of cash, no debt. And, you know, our stock has been holding up quite well and starting to perform nicely. I think there's still a lot of upside, but I don't think that we've missed any opportunities in the royalty sector um, recently. There has been a lot of competition. People are chasing after deals. There's a lot of money chasing after these deals. So, when I talk about returning cash to shareholders, we, we look at our valuation, you know, especially through these NCIBs, these normal course issuer bids, these buybacks essentially, and we, we see how cheap our stock is and we, we buy it back. Um, you know, if we, if we saw a royalty that was cheap, that was presented to us, we would look at buying that as well, either using our, our, our shares or raising ca uh, equity to, to pay in cash or the cash on our balance sheet if it's a smaller transaction. But right now we think the cheapest royalty play out there is actually Sailfish. So it's not like we are myopic about our view of the world in this sector. We do look at other opportunities. Uh, we have done a lot of M&A. You can look at the track record. And if we're not doing M&A now, it's because we choose not to. And we rather uh, buy back our shares, which we think are deeply discounted. So I will go back to a slide that talks about the portfolio. I'll start at the top. So the six royalties, one stream, one silver property, they are all in the Americas. You can see we have uh, exposure to the US, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Brazil. And starting at the top with Spring Valley, this is to us uh, one, of the, one of the most exciting uh, undeveloped projects in all of Nevada. It uh, was a 5 million ounce deposit uh, in all categories, measured, indicated, and inferred, when Barrick last did an update on the project when they when they owned it back in 2014. Today, this project is owned by a private equity firm based in Toronto named Waterton. They are private, which means no press releases, which means no CDAR for them. They're very fortunate not to have to make all those filings. The downside of that is that we don't get to talk to you guys about what the latest numbers are at Spring Valley. Now, Waterton is not in the business of holding assets forever. And at some point, they will have to do something with that asset. Either sell it, and there are plenty of mid-tier and large cap companies who like Nevada, might already have operations in Nevada, might want to get started in Nevada, and this could be a platform asset, satisfy all of those um, you know, desires that, that a company has in dealing with uh, gold assets in Nevada. Or they can take the approach of spinning this out which we just talked about, uh, you know, that's how Sailfish got started, that's how Gavilanis is going to be uh, dealt with, and, you know, Waterton can put a team together, and they can push it out, be the majority shareholders, raise some capital, this asset will see the light of day. It's not going to be stashed away, especially at $1,900 gold, it's not going to be stashed away and, and sat on forever for gold, you know, to, to go to ridiculous levels. That, that there, is a, there is a timeline um, and so we're excited to, to see that progress. Also, there has been some activity in that a Cisco Royalties, the fourth largest royalty company by market cap, covered, covered by 14 analysts, just acquired a 2.5% stake that was last month in April in Spring Valley. That complements their half a percent that they already owned. You add the two together, they're at 3%, which is equivalent to the royalty we have. Very exciting. I think that created a lot of buzz. I've been telling people, some of you guys on this call will remember uh, me talking about Spring Valley, saying that it's uh, the type of royalty that belongs in one of the big three. I should have expanded my radius and said the big four because of Cisco. Uh, it was the one that ended up you know, consolidating that royalty that was owned by, by Red Kite and now has 3%. And you know, together with, with our 3%, there's there's another 1% that Waterton owns. Uh, so a total of seven. Some of you guys may think, well, that's too big a royalty for a 
gold mine in Nevada to carry. I would um, encourage you to take a look at the AIF and the financials for SSR Mining, a very cash flow generative mining company. One of their assets is in Nevada called Marigold. It's um, I think about a, a third of a gram per ton, open pit heap leach, and is a cash machine, especially at, at these gold prices. There is a royalty that depending on where they're mining, so the sequence of mining is anywhere from a couple percent to 10%. And when you do a life of mine average, it's just under 8%. So if a royalty like that can be carried by a, a mine in Nevada, you know, that's up and running today, there's there's no reason why, um, you know, this, this Spring Valley operation when it's in production can't carry the, uh, the essentially 6% because the 1% is owned by the operator. Moonlight is a 2% NSR, came with Spring Valley. We, Spring Valley and Moonlight came with Terraco. It was an acquisition we did in 2019. I think it'll go down as one of the, um, you know, the, the, the great acquisitions of royalties in this sector. Um, the, the asset was sitting there. Waterton had a convertible piece of debt that created issues for a lot of the buyers. But Akiba and myself, um, you know, we, we were, we came out of Wexford. Wexford are their specialists in restructurings and special situations. That didn't scare us away. So we were lucky enough to be the guys that uh, went in there with no competition. You know, it was a negotiated transaction and pick up this uh, this royalty. So we got Moonlight as well. And then uh, we also got a, a 1 million ounce deposit in Nevada, which we sold uh, for shares of a mining company. And uh, we used that cash to um, buy back more shares of Sailfish. We have Gavilanis, which we started talking about with regards to a spin out. For any of you guys out there that like silver, and if you like gold, you, you have to like silver. There's a, a, a beta um, relationship to between silver and gold. You know, if gold goes up, silver will go up more. If gold goes down, silver will go down more. And right now we're in a period where they're both going up and silver has been performing quite well. Um, I wouldn't be surprised for it to hit $30 a share in the, in the not too distant future. I'm talking the next couple of weeks, uh, or not, not share, but per ounce. And uh, Gavilanis is an asset that we have been warehousing for just this very moment. And shareholders of Sailfish uh, who come in for the royalties can stay for the silver property. We haven't spent very much money on it. We were spending about $180,000 a year prior to this year. We did the 43101, which was press released on the 18th. Uh, that took some time and money. So we've started spending more uh, money on that. But I like the analogy that uh, Akiba gave a while back when we were discussing spending money on Gavilanis to get it ready for the spin out. It's, anal it's, it's analogous to um, a seller of a home. You know, they, they, they want to sell their house and they want to get the best price possible. They want to sell it quickly, put a little paint on it, you know, uh, fix a few things here around there, do a little landscaping and you get a higher price. You make all that money back and more. So we are spending a little more on Gavilanis than we normally would, but we're getting it ready for the spin out. And we think that the value accretion is going to be tremendous. And when I say tremendous, just to give you guys a sense of scale, we can talk about the resource which was just put out. Here's a summary slide. And we've got about 22.4 million ounces of silver equivalent at a grade of 245.6 grams per ton silver equivalent. And there's a long formula down there for you to, to calculate what silver equivalent uh, is. It's a very conservative formula, but if you want to, we can just focus on the silver because this, is, this resource is about 85% silver. You know, 18.9 million ounces at 207 grams per ton, just silver. And if you think about what this can be worth in the public markets, there are companies with assets that have half the grade that are in even more remote parts of Mexico that um, have been drilled out extensively and are hitting a ceiling with regards to how many ounces they have. And they trade at very nice multiples. I'm talking you know, 50, 60, 70 million market caps, up to 100 million Canadian market caps. And we have this asset that it, that's sitting inside of Sailfish that we're getting ready to push out. And if you look at comps on a on a EV per ounce basis, which is one of the most simple ways of valuing resource ounces in, or resource uh, assets in our sector, um, you have companies trading at about a dollar uh, per EV ounce on the low end, 
those are the low grade remote um, you know deposits and then the higher grade higher grade you go the the bigger the premium you get and it goes up to two dollars you know so if you assume something like a dollar fifty a dollar thirty per these 19 million ounces of silver only that we have you're looking at a really nice valuation you're looking at uh, 25 30 percent of the current market cap of sailfish and you know before i ran this silver mining or sorry this um royalty company and before kiba and i were, were doing marlin and mako and the other things we do in the public sector we were behind a screen investing much like you guys are and there were times when we saw opportunities like this where you could get involved with something on the ground floor and really make some good uh, multiples on your capital and i encourage anyone who wants to roll up their sleeves the, the 43101 was just published today. I'm getting it up on the website shortly, um, but it's out there on CDAR. And you know, just just pull it down, look at the PDF, read the data, read what the experts have to say. You know, Matt Gray at Resource Geosciences and um, uh, Derek Unger, who's at MDA, uh, which who who works with Steve Ristorcelli, who helped us with or who did the resource. At, um, at San Albino, you know, these are people we respect, We've, we respect their work, and just, just read what they have to say, and especially about the exploration potential at Gavilanes. This resource is uh, only three veins, and there are at least eight that have been traced at surface, so the other five are not included in the resource. They have had little to no drilling. I think only two of the veins have been drilled historically, and the other three are, are virgin, and, you know, one of the first things that Gavilanes, when it's in its new home, is going to have is an exploration budget. And since since Sailfish has owned this or Marlin before that, we acquired it in 2015 from a company called Santa Cruz Silver. Uh, Arturo Prestamo is um, you know, a friend of mine and there was a, a, a deal to be had there. We did the deal. And uh, since that time, we've done nothing other than maintain the concessions. So this is just been waiting, Sil silver nearing $30 an ounce, I think is a perfect time to start drilling it. So um, very exciting on that front. I'll go back to going through the portfolio. We have La Cigarra and El Compas. La Cigarra, they're both in Mexico. La Cigarra is actually a silver property. Uh, we have a 1% NSR on that. It's early stage, it's owned by Kootenay Silver. Um, El Compas is actually a producing royalty, 1.5% in Zacatecas. We think it's a small mine and it's been generating cash, which has been useful for us to you know, cover some of the overhead. But the real upside on El Compas is what's beneath the mine that is currently being mined out. And in Zacatecas, when you talk about a prolific system for silver, there's not a more prolific system in the world. El Compas is actually a gold and silver mine. So it's, it's kind of an oddball uh, within Zacatecas but there are some geologists that we have a lot of respect for who have looked at the land package and are very interested in what's going on further at depth. So that's a royalty that we talk about from a cash flow perspective, but it's really exciting from an exploration perspective. San Albino, we talked about that already, the 3% uh, stream, it's actually a, a stream equivalent to a 3% NSR, and then the 2% NSR in the area surrounding that. And then Token Tanzino, that's a feasibility level asset in Brazil, 1.7 million ounces of reserves, pretty much uh, permitted, ready to go. It's owned by El Dorado. El Dorado is, um, has indicated they do not want to build it. They want to sell it. So we are waiting for the press release to go out on that. Hopefully it's uh, sometime this year that they've found a buyer, that the buyer is eager to build it because it's ready to be built. And at today's gold prices, and you know, uh, I can imagine there are a lot of people operating in Brazil or Latin America who are taking a look, uh, doing site visits, and I can't wait for the day for something to happen there. Also, with regards to Tokens and Zinho, we, we did some M&A. So um, it was a 3.5% NSR. The operator, in this case El Dorado, has the right to buy down 2% on a construction decision. So we really only had a percent and a half. But I say only, but that's on 1.7 million ounces of reserves. So not so small, but a 1.5% NSR, we sold half of that, so 0.75% to one of our competitors, Metalla, and um, you know it, it was a deal that I think works well, worked well for them. They they did another acquisition of a Brazilian royalty the same week, and 
um, you know, it's part of a new strategy for them and I think it'll work out very well, but it was also good for us because we received US 9 million of cash, which we used to buy back shares. We used to repay our debt. We had a small amount of debt left over from the acquisition of Terraco, that's gone. And we also have, are using to fund the, um, the spin out of Gavilanes, including some work that we're doing on an asset that's owned by our controlling shareholder, Wexford Capital, that we plan to combine with Gavilanes and put those two together to create a more viable company at Spinout. And um, we're I'm not going to go into too many details on that just yet. We want to get some stuff out in the public market about Commonwealth and about the transaction first. But it's an asset in Arizona, silver and gold, a historic asset. And uh, I think the, the two assets will go really well together and add, add a lot of heft to, um, to the story. So that's the portfolio. I'll go back up to the capital structure slide and you can see that pie over there. It's not your typical pie chart for a junior royalty company. We have a controlling shareholder in Wexford Capital. Uh, management and directors, if you include the in the money options, so this is on a fully diluted basis, we're over just over 10%. And we've got Mr. Paul Stevens, who is a well-known and successful investor in, in the royalty sector. Um, we always um, like getting feedback from him and his thoughts on things, and he's a, a big shareholder there. He doesn't allow me to put the percentage that he owns, but um, you know, it's I'll tell you it's over over six uh, percent. And uh, and then the rest of you guys, if any of you guys are shareholders, you you know, you, uh, thank you for for coming along uh, on this company. Um, no more debt. We have excess cash. Our market cap is still just around 80 million bucks US, which um, it's, it's actually interesting because uh, BMO, one of the uh, firms that covers uh, Cisco royalties, uh, came out with a NAV on a Cisco royalties now that it's owned by, or sorry, on Spring Valley, the 3% the NSR, now that it's inside of a Cisco royalties. When, when it was just a half a percent, I think they gave it a nominal value or, or maybe even no value, but now that it's a 3% and they spent actually spent money to acquire that two and a half um, recently, they, they BMO wanted to update their numbers. They spent some time with management and they came up with a 99 million Canadian uh, number. I'm um, still looking into the, the model to see what some of their assumptions were, but that's about 78, 80 million US. Now, um, do I think that's what I could get for Spring Valley today if I did? you'd see a press release that it was sold, but um, is it 50, 60, 70 million bucks somewhere along the way with gold doing what it's doing with the asset, getting closer to being in the hands of a company that can develop it? Absolutely. And, you know, you could make the argument that the market cap today of Sailfish, net of the cash, net of the spin out, which I think um, is going to fetch, you know, um, we talked about these numbers earlier at a dollar uh, US per uh, silver ounce, it could be 20 million bucks. You know, that, I'm kind of thinking that's a base case. You know, so net of that, you, you're getting, you're essentially getting all the other royalties for free because the the, the valuation of Sailfish is justified just with um, with Spring Valley. Let, you know, and and we've, we're starting to receive cash flow from San Albino, the uh, the stream that's going to be over the next 12 months over 2 million US in, in that period. Um, you know, it's it's a this is a very strong value proposition. And um, you know, I, I, I can't say, stress enough how, how cheap the company is. And we've, we've talked about the company before um, in the context of things that were going to happen. Well, those things have happened. We're, we're starting to receive cash at San Albino. We're getting ready to spin out Gavilanes. We're talking about it publicly. It's in press releases that we filed the 43101. There was a, a, a trade on, on Spring Valley, which we had been talking about how valuable that was and strategic it was and how it will, will end up in the hands of the big three. Again, my mistake, I should have said big four, but all these things that we told investors early on are starting to happen and um, would love to get a little credibility here because it's, uh, it becomes frustrating at times, although we, we have taken matters into our own hands through the uh, share buyback. Um, here is the team. You guys already met Akiba, probably know him quite well uh, from his marketing of Mako. Um, Brian McKenzie, who came along with the acquisition of Terraco, he's been wonderful, great guy to have on the team. Paulo Lestrito, and this is an important hire. 
Uh, we brought him on to the team this year. Uh, he had been an advisor to Sailfish when he was a, at Red Cloud, so he was familiar with our business. He's the VP Corp Dev of Sailfish. However, the, the press release when he was hired stated that his primary responsibility is to oversee the spin out of Gavilanes, which he's been doing a, a great job at. And when that company is spun out, we expect Paulo to take the helm, to be the CEO. And um, that's, you know, so there's more to him being hired than just helping out at Sailfish. He's, the plan is to get him to, to be, um, you know, at, at Swordfish and to run that as an independent company and, and maximize value. Uh, you'll see here on the on the on my left um, that we Akiba and I, as founders or co-founders of this company, have been compensated with equity up to this point. Will that always be the case? I, you know, I, I don't know. We'll see. You know how the how the company progresses and how the cash flow situation changes. But while we were growing this business and didn't have any cash, we didn't pay ourselves. We we used that cash to fund buybacks, to uh, fund acquisitions, to fund overhead um, of, of things we needed to be a public company. So we made the ultimate sacrifice, but we, we have been getting um, you know, options, which we are um, very happy to have because we think that that is going to be a much better uh, payout than having received you know, some stipend over the course of the last uh, three or four years. Um, that's it for now. I'd, I'd love to open it up to Q&A because I, I love this audience. Uh, you know, I've, I know a lot of the people I've been looking at the attendee list and uh, I miss seeing them in person, but I, I want to answer some of their questions. Thank you, Akiba. Very well presented as always. Um, thank you, Caesar. Very well presented as always. We're going to turn and start with uh, Murray Vanderbilt. Murray, do you have questions today for Caesar? Scott, you're handling muting, correct? Yeah, Murray, you'd have to unmute yourself. I sent, there you go. There he is, there he is. Can you hear us, Murray? We're not able to hear you, so perhaps you could send in your message to the chat feature. Okay, let's go to Mike Potter, we can come back. Okay. Um, Thanks for the talk, Caesar. Um, would you like to give some more details of the rationale behind the buybacks? Because I, I can see um, the benefit to you, the people you're buying the shares from, but the benefit to the people left, the shareholders left behind, seems a rather more nebulous. Well, um, myself, Akiba. The guys at Waxford, Paul Stevens, we're, we're the largest shareholders that um, have been left behind. And I think that, um, you know, having more ownership of these assets is, is a positive, uh, which is the result of, of these buybacks. So uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, no, no, um... I, I really can't, I don't like buybacks, <laughs> put it that way. Um, I'd much rather see um, um, either you reinvesting or else do, do a special dividend or something. That, that's my point. Oh, well, uh, I think um, a dividend and a buyback, that is a conversation worth debating. And, um, but, but the acquisitions, that's a whole other element. Right, because with, with an acquisition, you're asking me as as the guy running the, this company to acquire something um, that that I think is cheap. That's the only reason I would do it. That I think would be accretive to my business. Well, that has to compete with the acquisition of the shares of my own company, right? And and I and I was very clear about that in the presentation. We we've been doing buybacks because we think our stock is cheap. If the stock's at a, at a level that we don't think it makes sense to do, to do buybacks, we won't. Uh, we still haven't, we'll, we, we're, we're creating a mechanism to get cash out through dividends. We're exploring that. And, and we'd love to do m and if it makes sense. So, you know, a, a lot of people have created royalty companies recently, and they all say the same thing, that they're going to grow to the moon. 
good luck because there aren't that many royalties out there. And if everybody's competing to get the same royalties, I don't understand how it's going to make sense for everybody. It doesn't work that way. It, you know, so uh, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage our business. We made acquisitions. We were, we, we, we started this in 2014. You know, there was, there was probably less than 10 precious metals royalty companies at that time. And, and today the number is two and a half that and growing. So it, it's a cost of capital game. And if we had been given a better valuation early on, maybe our portfolio would be twice as large. You know, there were some, there were some nice portfolios that, that came out, but the numbers that people were willing to pay, we just couldn't, we weren't going to do. Thank you, Caesar. Michael, thank you for, very much for your question. Uh, let's go to Doug Loud. Doug, questions today for Caesar. Just have to unmute, Doug. Yeah, I got unmuted. Can you hear me, Caesar? Yes. Um, as you know, I'm a I'm a recovering securities attorney, and so I'm easily confused by the words buyback. So, in my simplest way of looking at this, and I'm sort of in the Michael Potter school. The company earns some money. The company takes the money that it got and buys back shares from various people, perhaps you guys, perhaps not. But when the smoke clears, you all own more of the assets than you did before because there's less shares out. So your shares are now have more assets, if you will, behind them. And that is kind of the theory behind the buyback. So if you were one guy that we know who owns 25% of his company himself, he, uh, happily does buybacks is every time he does it with the money the company earned, he now earns, he's now worth more because he owns more of the representation of the assets. Is that roughly correct? Yeah, it becomes that, a, that makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a, a battle of attrition. If there are shareholders who want to sell their shares at these prices and we think that the price is, uh, is, is low for what we have and we, we have a pretty good idea of what we have. We live and breathe it. And, um, you know, I think one of these, uh, one of the points that I made in this presentation about Gavilanis, once this company is publicly traded, we won't, there will be no debate as to what it's worth. And I challenge anybody that's on this presentation to come up with a number that is equivalent to where it's trading at today which will be a, a very hard task because I think that Gavilanis inside of Sailfish today is trading for, for zero. Cause I think that, I think the, the royalty portfolio is cheap. Yeah, yeah, you're probably getting no credit for Gavilanis at the moment in terms of the stock price. It, exactly. So what we do when we have excess cash is we're, if, if people, look, we wouldn't be doing buybacks if our stock was fully priced. You know, we, we do them because we think our stock is cheap. And we think our stock is cheap because of the um, the assets that we have inside, the milestones that have been taking place. And uh, look, this is this is not a company. We have no research coverage. Um, you know, it's very right. tightly held. Um, I you know I'm, I've been doing more marketing, and I thank David and his team for setting this up and getting a lot of people on. We need to do more of this. I will do more of this, but. With gold, gold and silver prices doing what they're doing, the assets doing what they're doing, the spin out, you know, getting closer and closer to happening. Um, I think the stock's cheap, and and I, you know, I want to reward shareholders who are in it for the long term by taking out shareholders who are happy to to give their stock, you know, back to the company. And then your shares have more assets behind them, which makes yeah. sense. Um, I have another silly question, which is because my math isn't very good. When you talk about the 3% NSR at Spring Valley or one of any one of these companies, how much money is that that you okay. get in, your, in the company's hot little hands each year or each quarter? That's a very good question. So let's do let's do some math. So oh, so this is a uh, the last res, uh, uh, resource and I can show you because I have it here in the presentation. Let me just go to it. When Barrick put a resource statement together. It totaled 5 million ounces. The M&I was 4.12. So let's use 4 million. So these guys have 4 million ounces that uh, are in M&I. And if you put a mine plan around that, um, you have to assume this will be a heap leach, which means the recoveries will be 
if you look at the metallurgy that's been done here in, in, in this part of the, the world in Persian County, let's just to be conservative, assume 75%. So if you have a, a 4 million ounce deposit and you're recovering 0.75, that's 3 million ounces of recoverable. Now, at a 50,000 ton per day, at, the, at, at this, um, at this gra grade, we, we did the math and you know, to get to about a 12-year mine life, um, that, that's kind of where the, the, the numbers make sense. So we take that 3 million and we divide it by 12 to get an annual. So you're at 250,000 ounces a year. So at today's gold prices, pardon me? Which is a great number. A lot of companies sounded good at 30,000 ounces. Yeah, yeah, this, this is a big boy. So at 250,000 times, let's just use $1,800 gold. You're looking at 450 million of revenue. Of that, we would get 3%. So times, uh, you know, point. Oh, 03 so that's 13 and a half thousand ounces a year uh, or sorry 13 and a half million dollars a year and then there's some withholding tax um, about 26 percent so let's just assume 0.75 or 0.74 times 0.74 so that's about 9.99 million so call it 10 million of net uh, revenue after tax as the royalty holder right so you're sitting there you're getting 10 million dollars they're down there in the sun mining all this stuff so the theory of you get the benefit of the mine without having to have the mine holds. Yeah, and, and one thing I, I want to plan in your head is next time you're on a royalty presentation or a presentation for a royalty company, ask the royalty company how many royalties they have that pay them over 10 million or more net of tax a year. And if you're on with Franco, Wheaton, um, you know, Royal, and a Cisco, they will be able to tell you. All the other guys, I need to check this, but I'm pretty sure all of the other companies um, w w do not have a royalty that that has that type of cash flow generation profile. This is this is big, and and yeah. you know you have companies that the very large guys they're trading at a multiple to their NAV, so 10 million a year of cash flow in their business is worth you know a lot. It's, it's, it's worth a lot more than 10 million in a smaller cap company, which is why I'm so confident that at some point when the asset is in the right hands, when we're ready, we'll be able to, to do uh, M&A and the carrot will be this the Spring Valley royalty because it's gold, it's in Nevada, and it's big. Great. Okay. That logic appeals to my tiny brain. And, and, and Mexico and Nicaragua are behaving themselves as governments vis-a-vis -vis your properties? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Mexico, we operated in, Akiba and I, we learned a lot about mining by mining a uh, open pit heap leach down in Sinaloa. And oh. the, the government, they were never really the issue. Um, the, the violence became a big issue. Um, you know, Latin America, they're, the countries are generally slow because they're more bureaucratic. But once you figure out the system, it's important to have a team that knows how to operate there. So if you can tell by my name, I, I'm a Latino. I was actually born in Mexico in Cuernavaca. Uh, my parents are from there. I have a lot of family in Mexico City and in Veracruz and in, um, and in Morelos, where Cuernavaca is. And if you look at the team at MAKO, for example, you have Jesse Munoz who uh, has dual, citizen, dual citizenship, Mexico, US, fluent Spanish speaker. Um, Millie Paredes, she's from Peru. Um, you know, she lives in the US now, fluent in both languages, has operated in, in, in uh, various parts of Latin America. You know, Jesse and his team, you know, Gildardo uh, Vejar, um, Ramon Encinas, Arnold Herrera. So you, you have to build a team of people who are familiar with those locales, and, and you'll do fine. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Caesar. You've solved my questions. Happy to do so. Thank you, Doug, for all your questions. Uh, we'll, let's see if uh, Murray can unmute now. Murray? Love to get your question, Murray. Always, always. You know, um, Murray's having a little trouble, so actually he's been chatting in his question. Um, That's fun. Right. And uh, and Akiba has been answering it. Okay. 
All right, so shall we go to Stratos? Okay, sure. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Stratos. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think most of my questions have been covered. The only thing I want to ask you, Caesar, is a general question about the royalty space. Would you say that um, some of the companies, especially the big ones and the mid-tier ones, are actually really overvalued in the sense that the, uh, they are trading at, at multiples that actually are approaching some technology companies, some ridiculous multiples of P ratios and enterprise value to cash flow? Um, would you say that probably this is true, or you think they are trading at, at more fair fair levels? I think. Let me go back to a slide here, and I will. It's not updated all the way, but it will give you a good glimpse into why so many people want to do royalties. So this is a chart, equal weighted for the big guys um, that existed back in 08. So Franco Nevada, Wien Precious Metals, Royal Gold, and then Sandstorm. It was actually just going public that year. And then gold, uh, represented by the GLD, gold equities, the GDX. And you can see here the returns. Um, the royalty business is a fantastic business. Um, the head of Wexford says uh, it's, it's so easy. All you need is, is one guy to go and pick up the checks in the mail. Um, and it, if you look at some of these statistics that are in the slides of the large royalty companies, you'll see that they talk about revenue per employee, uh, which is something that not very many companies like to mention because they that, that doesn't look so good for them. For the royalty companies, it looks fantastic. If you run a royalty company right, you can run it with a handful of people, even a very large one. And and because of that. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think it was Doug who was asking some questions earlier, and he said when we we're talking about Spring Valley, you know, you guys are collecting this, you know, 10 million a year, while the the other guys are out in the sun toiling, you know, making the gold. Um, I, I have sympathy because Akiba and I, we, we mine gold as well uh, in Nicaragua. We did so in Mexico, and we're also on the royalty side. We're playing both sides, but the royalty side is is more of a gentleman's game, where their contracts, their register, you have security, um, if you're doing streams, you, you, it's, it's a game for a, a banker, you know, it's a, it's a cost of capital game. Um, but it, it is a very lucrative uh, business, which is why the multiples are so high. And I, I don't want to comment on whether the valuations are over overstretched. Um, we're in a world right now where you can literally create a password on a computer and sell it for millions of dollars. So I, I, I don't want to talk about valuation. You know, I, I'm very happy that these companies are trading where they are. I want to catch up to them. You know, I, I want them to see value in what we own. Uh, I, I want some of these bigger companies to be traded at very high valuations because then they can pay more for what we have if we eventually want to monetize our portfolio. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Stratos. Always a pleasure having you on the calls. Scott, shall we go to you for the questions from the uh, the audience? Yeah, I wanted to first check in with um, Dr. Wood. Dr. Wood, can you uh, do you have a question today? Uh, you are. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I had not heard the sailfish uh, uh, presentation before. I've heard Mako's uh, presentation several times. Uh, this was very impressive. The numbers look absolutely outstanding, and uh, uh, the stock does look uh, underpriced by uh, by huge amounts. Um, tell me on the uh, silver property that you're planning to uh, divest, um, are you're going to actually internally run it you've, because you've already got a CEO uh, plan. How much money are you going to uh, uh, raise? Is this going to, uh, the shares go to, uh, go to shareholders of Sailfish? 
Uh, is there going to be a um, rights offering? Um, how can uh, Sailfish shareholders receive shares of uh, uh, Swordfish? Okay, very good question. So the way we did Sailfish, Sailfish was, was originally a subsidiary of Marlin Gold Mining, LTD, and it was spun out in late 2017, started trading in 2018 in January, and it was done in the form of a, um, of a dividend, uh, which is what we're going to do with this one as well. So Gavilanes is going to be contributed to a company, a shell, that, um, that will take Gavilanes and another asset at the same time. Sailfish shareholders will get shares of that company. They're going to use shares of that shell co to pay for the asset. So that's how Gavilanes is going to go from Sailfish into this new co. And those shares we're going to distribute. We're going to send them out to everybody. They'll, they'll show up in your brokerage account. Um, and, and you'll have shares of, of Swordfish Silver Corp. Once it's out of the company, they're going to raise money on their you know, as a standalone. Um, Sailfish, uh, depending on the valuation, may put in uh, some some capital. Uh, it won't be a large amount, just to help get get it started to complement the the raise that they're doing from other investors. But uh, to get distribution uh, as a public company this shell needs sailfish shareholders so so we will distribute those shares to everybody who owns sailfish and and from that point on swordfish will be its own company um, there may be a, a shareholding of sailfish into swordfish but for the most part it's going to be the sailfish shareholders that own it directly uh, but there there won't be a rights offering for uh sailfish uh, shareholders to buy additional shares no of sort of no that's not what we have been thinking of doing it's interesting uh, concept and i've seen that done before but swordfish will raise money independent uh so if, if you were interested in investing in, in swordfish at you know you you can you can subscribe for that but as a shareholder of sailfish you will get your um your your stake in the new company um you know, will the money raise uh I, I hate to just be asking lots of questions but will the money raise for swordfish be done after it's free trading or uh before it's free trading after because okay. as, a, okay. as a shell um and in other words people who invest are not going to get shares in a, a, a private company they're going to get shares in a shell that is going public um you know contemporaneous with the raise okay. yeah okay in in my just in my experience with this uh if the asset is not worth anything and it goes into the other company then whatever shares you receive is a dividend that's that's good However, if the asset is really valuable and uh, it is put into a shell and you get a very few number of shares uh, as a shareholder, then you're really losing a, a asset out of the company that you already own shares that had it given, been given a little money and a little development could have been very valuable to your shares. You see what I mean? I, Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. if, okay. if, if Sailfish were a mining and exploration company, we wouldn't be doing this unless unless there was an unless there was a uh, there was a metal that didn't make sense with the metal that we were primarily looking for. So right. if this was a copper asset and we were primarily a gold company. Then yes, especially at today's copper prices, a, a spin out would make sense. Even we've seen silver assets come out of gold companies because silver is, is, is up a lot more than gold, you know, or vice versa. We've seen that. But here, it's very different. They're two different businesses. We have royalties, which we talked about our, um, you know, uh, gentleman's game. And then we have the mining, this mining asset, which requires 
uh, a team of people to roll up their sleeves, to drill holes in the ground, to raise capital. So we want to keep Sailfish as a royalty company. We warehouse Gavilanes, where we were only paying the concession taxes to keep the property going, but not doing anything on the exploration front. And if we were to do so, the cash we have on the balance sheet, the cash that we're getting from uh, San Albino could, would, could be consumed by this asset. We'd rather give put that into a, a, a company where that's its primary focus, it's raising capital to do that. Otherwise, I'd have a bunch of disgruntled share, a royalty shareholders saying, you know, you're ruining my my royalties by funding this this silver property. You know, so right. that's really the rationale. That ha that actually happened to Cisco Gold Royalties when they bought Barkersville. But thank you had a, a one, it was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I'm grateful. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yeah, so David, I do have some questions from the audience. Okay, let's go, let's have a question or two and then we'll proceed to close. Okay, um, all right, first one is, yeah. what kind of valuation will Commonwealth bring to Sailfish, Swordfish, I'm sorry. That's a good question. Um, so Commonwealth, is an asset that was acquired by Mako in 2015, or sorry, by Marlin, the predecessor of Mako. And we actually did quite a bit of work. So Akiba and I are both familiar with the asset. When the merger between Marlin and Golden Rain took place to form Mako and the stream on San Albino was restructured, Commonwealth was taken private by Wexford in exchange for what was $75 million of debt, which uh, it included a, a accrued interest. So it was the principal plus the accrued interest added up to about 75 million. Do we think it's worth 75 million? No, um, that was a transaction where Wexford was facilitating um, you know, a merger. They had a bigger picture in mind and it's played out for them very well because if you look at what Mako is worth today, what Sailfish is worth today, what um, you know, Commonwealth wants its place in this new vehicle will be worth with Gavilanes. When you add up all the some of the parts, Wexford was very smart to keep this whole um, you know uh, suite of assets going. But going back to the question, what 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 does it add? Commonwealth is in the United States of America. It's on private land, 3,600 acres of fee simple land. Uh, a lot of that. The underlying mineral rights are also owned, uh, not all. So in some areas, it's just the surface rights without mineral rights. But in addition to that, it's about, um, I think, 7,300 acres of mineral rights, pretty much in a contiguous package covering the main targets. We think it'll be a district over time. There's a historic mine there, the Commonwealth Mine, which when it was up and running in the late 1800s, uh, rivaled the mine uh, over at Tombstone. You know, it was a bigger mine. The difference is Tombstone had the, the, the gun battle at the OK Corral and is memorialized, whereas Pierce, the, the historic town around Com the Commonwealth mine, there's about uh, five houses left and it's a, go it's a ghost town. But, um, but the mine's still, still there, the mineralization's still there, waiting to be explored. And what we think it'll add is, is it was historically a silver mine, so in, in today it's more gold than it is silver, but the potential is still there to, to discover more silver. Um, so it has the silver component to it. It um, has the ability to be put into production within a reasonable timeline. You know, I'm not talking about the next two years or so. It needs to be drilled out to be made bigger, but for a very low dollar amount, it could act, it has a credible path to production. Gavilanes, if you look here, we have a picture. It's in the Sierra Madres. Um, it's it's a great exploration property, but uh, we think that this is a property where we spend the money to bulk it up, to get it to 100 million ounces, to try to get it to 100 million ounces at the same grade profile that, it, that we have now with only 47 holes into it. It's a massive land package of over 13 and a half thousand you know, hectares um, with, a, with a lot of targets to explore. And we think it'll attract the attention of a big guy for a sale. So when you combine the two, 
um, when we when we go into this business, we, we don't like to just have one strategy. We we like to have multiple strategies because things change, and and swordfish will have the ability to advance something in a tier one jurisdiction like Arizona, you know, the U.S. Um, the 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 uh, ability to fund exploration in a very exciting district, you know, scale a land package down in, in Durango, and it, it just I think they complement each other very very well. Um, so so that's the uh, the rationale for for putting them together, give scale, um, diversification, and, and that's the reason. Thank you for that. That was a that was a really thorough answer. Uh, the next question is. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Caesar. What was the Spring Valley resource calculation before it was taken private, if you know? We have a slide for that. Uh, I was on it a little while ago, and I'll go back to it. So it was 5 million ounces total. It's th There you go. So this was from 2014. We, we, we've been told that Waterton is working on a pre-feasibility study, that it's essentially um, final. Uh, but unfortunately, they're, they're a private company, and they don't put this information out for, for public consumption. So we have to wait for them to either take this asset public uh, with a team or to sell it to a publicly traded company to get updated numbers. But, you know, the goal 0.63 uh, open pit with a less than two to one strip ratio, which is what this, what this deposit um, was looking like, at least when it was last modeled, that that'll work as a heat bleach in, in Nevada. It'll work really well. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Marigold, which is a cash flow machine, is operating I think at 0.3 grams per ton, so half the grade. Uh, they get they get amazing recoveries on their leach pad, and they're using very large scale equipment. I think they have 400 ton haul trucks. But um, you know, the open pit heat bleaches of this type of grade actually are are, are quite profitable. Um, and with with not very much upfront capex relative to the amount of uh, gold they can produce. All right, thank you. Uh, and the final question we have so far from the audience is, why would the company consider a dividend instead of? Uh, I'm sorry, why would the company consider a special dividend instead of regular dividends? Does an SIB make more sense than a special dividend? Good question. So I'm getting a bit ahead of myself in talking about what kind of dividend we're, we're going to pay when we um, have a steady amount of cash flow coming in from San Albino, which should be toward the end of the year. Um, I, I like special dividends because you, you're not, uh, you, you evaluate the cash you have on hand, what your needs are, what's coming through the door, and you can pay out the, the money. Um, when you when you put in a, a regular dividend that's, that's quarterly and that, um, you know, you, you've kind of announced this is what we're going to pay at a minimum. Um, it kind of becomes a form of debt. You know, I, I saw this happen with the MLPs in, um, in the oil and gas sector. Before I, I joined Wexford, I was at Lehman Brothers from 2005 to 2008. I left just before the bankruptcy and we created, uh, we were investors uh, in, in a few uh, royalty companies that had to cut their dividends, had to cut their distributions and it was death, you know, and um, and so I guess a little bit of that experience has still stayed with me. Um, so if, if, if we go the route of doing a stated quarterly dividend, it'll be smaller than what a special dividend uh, could theoretically be, just so that we can make sure we can cover it with cash flow. We've seen uh, some royalty companies covering dividends with, with debt, and that's just not something that we, we, we want to do ourselves. So, but we're, it's early days. We're still, we're still researching it. Excellent, thank you. David? Scott? Yep, that's okay. our final from the audience. And if anybody has any more questions, always please, you can email us. We will get the questions to Caesar and get answers back out to you. So thank you, everyone. Oh, there you have it. Caesar Gonzalez, he's the director and the CEO and the co-founder of Sailfish Royalty Corp. Um, Caesar, back to you for any closing remarks. Just to thank you to everybody who's on this call. I know your time is precious, and uh, you know being on the call means you're interested in our company. Just take a look at our track record. Take a look at where our interests are. You know, we're, we're shareholders. We've we've compensated ourselves in shares uh, in building this business, and it hasn't been easy. 
<laughs> nothing in this world seems to be easy anymore. And um, but we're happy to have done it because uh, we think there's a lot of upside. Uh, we'd love for you guys to come along and, and make money um, alongside us as, as shareholders. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your attendance today. Greatly appreciated and wish you a pleasant evening.